Hi, everybody. Welcome to April Culturama. This is going to be recorded and put on our Culturama community page, which is culturamacommunity.blogspot.com. And so if you've got somebody you think would benefit from this. Uh, today, we're going to talk about um, those things that keep us from writing. Uh, the way I call this is, is writer's block, but I, I don't know that I want to call it writer's block because uh, that sometimes gets, I don't know, defamed. Um, people will... Um, talk about it in the, in the wrong way. And there's also, there's multiple things when we're talking about writer's block. There's, there's, the, there's the person that'll write for a few pages and then stop writing. Um, and that's, that's they just don't have anything else to say. And actually, Bonnie helped me with this, which was, uh, you need to, to always be thinking about the scene goal, right? And that's very often what that is. You, you just don't have a scene goal, <clears throat> you're world building. But we're not going to talk about that stuff. We're, what, I, what I really want to talk about today are those uh, things that are really stopping us from writing. Um, and um, I, I'm going to get to that in a, in a couple of minutes. Bonnie asked a question right before we started taping uh, about um, revision. You, you, you wanted to, me to, to expand on something, Bonnie. Yes. Um, you had talked about the emotional, finding the emotional center of your short story. And what you said was brilliant. And no surprise there. And what I wanted to know was at one of you, you kind of repeat that. And two, and the idea being that we dream on paper, essentially. And so, of course, when you revise, there's a lot of good stuff that you just kind of need to send to the word spa. But, um, but how you could apply that maybe to personal essays as well. Just whatever you'd like to say about that. Okay. Well, I'm what I was saying, there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mute some people here because we're getting a little static. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure who it's from, so I'm just kind of randomly muting people. Uh me just a moment. Um, okay, so what, what I was saying about that is when, when you're revising, um, what, what you're looking for, what, what do you keep, what do you don't keep? And there's a difference between editing and revising. Editing is making sure that your commas are right and that you're, you're, you know, you've, you're using the right, uh, you've got parallel structure, et cetera, et cetera, right? The, the grammar stuff, the spelling stuff, all, all that stuff. What revising is, is making sure that you um, understand what your story's about. Uh, you understand what's going on. Sometimes you'll see a strange outlier. And you say, well, what's this thing about? What are, what are these things doing? And the, the, the way that I have revised is the first thing I do is I'll, I'll read my story and figure out what is the story about? What, what is the emotional center of the story? So sometimes it's a story, right? So I want to write about Tom and Jane falling in love. Um, and so it's that love relationship. I'm going to do that. Sometimes though, it's not that. And I think of the, the, the example I quoted last time was Maud Martha. And Maud Martha is this great piece by Gwendolyn Brooks. And she said, well, what is it like to be a, an African-American woman in Chicago in the 50s, right? And she just wants to, to, to convey that idea. That's the emotional story, center of her story. Anything, as I'm reading, that, that's what I'm looking for. I, I, once I figured out what is that, that emotional center, that's what I'm looking for. This is the thing that I'm trying to, to convey. Um, and so anything that's not doing that, I'm going to take that out. Anything that's doing a little bit, maybe I'll enhance that. Right, and so it, it helps me to understand what's going on. So uh, another example I used was a story I, I wrote uh, years ago, where a 14-year-old goes up into the mountains with a like five or six 24-year-olds, and she realizes that they're, that they're all married but not to each other, and they're 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 having sex with each other. And um, I, I wanted to show what it's like to I, I want to get that outsider's pr perspective, right? What does it feel like to be an outsider? But there's a problem with doing 14 and 24-year-olds, right? Now we're distracted from being an outsider. And it's, there's something very creepy about that. And so how do you fix that? Well, you make her 17, you make them 19, not married, but dating, right? And so now you've got this, like she's entering a new world, yes. And there's a, a creep fact that world, but it's not, it's not child molestery, you know, which was a, a real problem. And so that, that's how I, I resolved that, right? So once you figure out what that emotional center is. Now, when you're de dealing with a personal essay, um, you've got the advantage of the thesis statement, right? Uh, especially with the with the, the, the academic essay, that, that that's very easy to revise because you're always coming back to that thesis and am I proving this thing or not? Should I be proving more than I need to change the thesis, right? And this is what, um, if you've ever taken my English one C or one A class, you you know I talk about that a lot. Um, 
And uh, I, I think with, with a personal essay, it becomes a little bit different because the thesis is, is a little less strong. There, there's now an emotional component to, to what you're writing as well, because you're not just writing about academic concepts, right? You're also writing about the human. So I think there's a level of, okay, who am I writing to as well? Um, you know, this is the, yes, this is how to revise my personal essay, but I know also that I'm not talking to people writing academic essays. I know that this is, these are people who maybe want to have something to say in terms of memoir. So they have some lived experience. Um, maybe that that's going to change the way I'm doing it as well. So I think, I think there's a level of audience that you have to be thinking about in the personal essay that you're not necessarily thinking about with fiction, right? Because it, it's, it's being directed towards somebody. Um, as opposed to being just kind of put out there in the world, I think. Um, now I, I don't do a lot of personal essays. I do some, um, but uh, what do you think? Does that does that hold water? Do you think there's more to expand there? Well, I think who is my reader? What you just said, and what do I want to tell this person? But I think also that the personal essay that I'm writing about uh, is everything from the academic all the way to creative nonfiction. Isn't that kind of a good container? Um, yeah. I'm trying to think of what, if this were a container, wouldn't you start kind of there all the way to creative nonfiction? Um, and then you say, I'm just really kind of thinking about some of your ideas. I've been, uh, as I said, writing about it all week. And this is helpful, John, thank you. Okay, good. And uh, let's, let's chat too uh, afterward. Um, uh, okay. Uh, oh, I hit the wrong button. Um, I, we, we really wanted, I, what got this prompted is a couple of people were talking about how they didn't, were having trouble writing. Um, and um, th th there's a problem here. A lot of people will come to you and say, I, you know, you'll, you'll start discussing writer's block and they will say, I don't have a writer's block. Writer's block's not, not a real thing. Um, uh, well, that, that's, that's really nice that you have that privilege, um, but the, the, usually the people talk, talking about this have some degree of privilege, right? And they are, what they're saying is that in my life, it's not that, you, you've probably, a lot of people have writer's block and the idea that uh, you should feel ashamed for that is, is wrong. Um, you should not take a, a shame-based approach to your writing. You should take, uh, you should understand that it's okay. So some of these things are blocking you. Now we're going to talk about several types of writer's block and where it comes from. And um, I'm going to propose some, some exercises. I'm going to suggest things that work for me, but not everything. I can't possibly cover everything. And I can't possibly tell you all the, the, the ways to, to, to do this, right? That's just outside of my experience. So some of the stuff I'm going to say, it works some of the time right? Uh, I think you should feel empowered to follow your own sort of thing. And I'm going to start with the idea of um, writer's block and re revision and trying to write the perfect story. That's sometimes really, uh, I'm, I'm just assuming story, but you know, we've got essay, we've got poem, trying to write the perfect anything. It's a real danger, the, the concept of perfection, especially in revision. And the danger is this, um, the idea that there's a platonic um, perfect story is uh, skewed toward, uh, well, it's, it's racist, classist, sexist, right? Um, it assumes that uh, there is some sort of thing that works for, for all people, right? And so we, we look to the, these writers that are given to us, um, that I give to my students uh, in my, my college classes, and we say, okay, well, it must be like that. that that's the thing, Hemingway, Hemingway, we, we'll, we will all write like Hemingway. Hemingway's a great writer. He's not the only great writer, right? Um, and if, if what you're trying to do is imitate uh, that and try to reach that sort of platonic ideal, you are in trouble because what you have to say is important too, right? You, you can't write like Hemingway. You just can't because you're not Hemingway. And it's a good thing. You, you, you have to be able to write like yourself. So this idea of perfect is just the wrong way of uh, conceiving of, of fiction, poetry, whatever, um, because it, there, there is no idea. I think of... Um, um, I've, I've been I've been doing a podcast recently about teacher movies, which I hate. I universally hate teacher movies, and one of the reasons I hate it is it starts off with this idea that we're going to fix the kids, um, we're going to save the kids. That's that's another thing. We're going to save these kids, right? A person is not something to be saved, right? And uh, what what you're doing when you're saying 
saves is you, you are making them into a copy of, of yourself, right? And so the kid goes off and Robin Williams says a couple of pithy lines and the kid is then saved. No, it's not that, that's not how humanity works. It's also not how fiction works or poetry or any, any of this. So the first thing we need to, 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 I think we need to remove is the ideal of perfection. Getting, I don't know what that other ideal is, right? What are we trying to do? Uh, I, I think at best, what I'm trying to do is communicate with another human being, right? At best, I realized that my, my life is difficult and it's, it's painful and so is other people's. And um, maybe I can write something that makes the world feel a little less lonely, right? And that is uh, a, a really good ideal to, to work toward. Now, if you're doing that, um, you don't have to be writing for this ideal perfect reader. You can be writing for, for your reader, right? The ideal perfect reader for Hemingway is, well, me, um, right? Uh, I, I read the story, the, about the complex interior life of middle-aged men. And somehow that just speaks to me. Uh, but um, that's not everybody, right? You writing to, to whomever that person is, trying to connect to that person, I think is a really great thing. And I, I think it's, it's um, tremendously important as, as well. Um, I, I, I don't want to read just about middle-aged uh, men, right? I, 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 I like reading about that. But I think the world becomes more interesting the more we see other people's perspectives interiors, that sort of thing. And that, that is uh, something that, that, that stops a lot of people, that, that um, concept of perfection, because it's just not that type of story that you've been given. It's just not what you want to be writing. Um, when, when I first started uh, in writing, I was writing flash fiction. This was in the 80s. And uh, I was writing a lot of flash fiction. I didn't know it was flash fiction. I was a teenager. I was, I was uh, just writing really short, short pieces and I really loved it. It really spoke to me. Then I went to college and um, uh, started sending this stuff out. Nobody knew what flash fiction was at the time. Uh, I, I, most of my rejections were things like, is that it? And so, okay, well, that, that's fine. Uh, I, I, I need to start writing longer things. Uh, I need, and so I started studying as you do, which is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Um, and I, then I started writing novels and short stories that were longer and fit other people's ideas. And um, uh, of course, now flash fiction is a big thing. And I started writing again. But I had all these years where I was writing this thing that, that really didn't feed my soul. And it wasn't very good um, also. Uh, it wasn't good for a lot of reasons. But part of the reason is just wasn't writing the thing that mattered to me. Um, now, why do I say this? Well, because that platonic ideal also suggests style, um, structure, these sorts of things. Style and structure matter but there, th there's not one single style of structure that's going to work, right? So you can be um, Pamela Painter, right? Pamela, I don't know if you've read any of Pamela Painter's works. Fantastic. It's magnificent. She writes like herself. And she's, I, 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 I reference her because she's a, um, uh, a flash fiction writer and she's one of my favorite. Or Brian Doyle, right? Just amazing work. Um, but it's different than other people's work and it's really good. Um, we also look back to these writers and we think, well, okay, well, that, that's how you're supposed to write. No, these great writers are usually great because they broke all of the traditions. They found something new. They found a way of talking. Before Vonnegut, nobody wrote like Vonnegut, right? Vonnegut was the man who wrote like Vonnegut. Um, before, um, uh, what is her name from, wrote six great novels, 1800s, um, Pride and Prejudice. Jane Austen. Jane Austen, thank you. Uh, before Jane Austen, nobody wrote like Jane Austen, right? She, she was doing something that was, was special. You doing something special is, is a really good thing. So I just want to move away from that idea of perfect. Um, uh, okay, so we, we also have this thing about the um, people tell you that there's no writer's block. Very often they will tell you this in a very condescending way. Um, and there, there's a tremendous danger to that. And that's adding shame and pain onto you. It's also ableist in its conception, right? Because there are real, really serious reasons that people are blocked. And if we simply say, okay, well, you just need to work harder. That's not gonna work for a lot of people. We need to, to change the way we, we approach this in, in a, a lot of the time. Um, okay, so uh, I, I just, I have a list of, I put a Facebook post up that many of you contributed to saying, what should I talk about? So I've got a list of 30 things here. I'm just gonna work through them and I probably won't get through all 30. And, and if, if you want to throw something in, you just please feel free to, to, to speak up. Um, okay, so um, the first thing that somebody asked about was um, the need for completion. 
um, right? And so, well, when I start something, I don't know if I'm going to to complete it, and that that's a that's a serious and a real thing. That's a that's a something that I I worry about too. I've I've started novels, and I've gotten about halfway through, and it's like I'm not really interested in this novel anymore, right? Um, and you know, so also I I I I've, I want to finish things because I want to be productive in a, in a, in a certain way. Um, there, there's a problem with the, the idea that we need to be productive all the time, I think. I think this is capitalism burned into our bones. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I also think it's, it's nice to get some stuff done, right? Anybody who knows me knows that I like to keep moving and keep getting this stuff done. Um, I, I think what the, probably the best thing you can do, do with this is um, trust that you have talent, trust that you have something to say, trust that you are going to complete something. It might change as you go. You might start with a novel and end with a short story, but I think you can, can trust this. A part of what you're not trusting is that your experience is interesting. And I, I think it is. Uh, and, and just reminded me of a, of a story. We, we were working with a guy and he, just, he, he, was, um, he was in his seventies and he said, I just don't have any interesting stories. I like grew up in Fresno and, uh, you know, it was kind of, didn't have a lot of money. I was I to write about this. And so we started talking about it and said, well, you're, you're kind of Vietnam era age. He said, oh, I was in the service, but I never went to Vietnam. What can I write about? I said, well, what did you do? I said, I was the personal bodyguard to Haile Selassie. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he was a personal gaudy, ga bodyguard to a man God, someone who declared himself, a, right? And he, his job was to, to make sure that Haile Selassie's uh, Pomeranians didn't like run into the street or whatever dog. It was some small dog like that. It's just, it's fascinating, right? Uh, and so now that's obviously he, he, he had a block. He wasn't saying what many of the things that were interesting in his life. But I think that's true of all of us, right? There are things that, are, that I do that are immensely interesting to other people, but I don't see that. Um, and um, I, I don't see what, that or why it's interesting to other, other human beings because it's my lived experience. It feels to me like this is what everybody lives through. I mean, you have all lived on the edge of the desert for your whole life, right? So no, that's not true. That, that, that's my, my lived experience. Uh, this, some other, other people's too. Right? Um, you have all uh, dri rid ridden the, the, the freeways in Los Angeles on a motorcycle for years. It's like, no, that's just me. There's a lot of people who've done it, but uh, not a lot of people who, who ride it. Um, you know, th this, this was me just being dumb. I kept riding my motorcycle after the accidents that I had, right? Um, that's, that's, that's a really dumb thing to do. But, you know, it's a, it's a, it's makes for, for, I, I have things to say now, this idea that I'm afraid of completion, which is, is another way of saying, um, I'm afraid I don't really have anything interesting enough to sustain that length of time. Well, I think you do. Um, I, I, I think it's hard to see, um, the, my own vision sometimes what, what's interesting about me because I, I just, I'm in this body. Um, but I, I think you absolutely you, you do right. Uh, just just me walking through uh, a store is interesting, right? Because I've got all these these experiences that other people don't. I, I used to my, my wife used to work at Disneyland, and when we were first dating, and so she would like m check me into Disneyland beginning of the day and I'd just kind of walk around because I had nothing better to do. I was unemployed and you know uh, disaffected, and so I'm like walking around Disneyland just all day long. And mostly what I looked at were the birds. Uh, because I, I know something about birds and I, I know something about nature. The rides aren't all that interesting to me. Um, I like to see how the birds are interacting with people and then how the cats function there. What, okay, that, that vision, that way of seeing is different than other people's. That's okay. We all have that different way of seeing, right? Um, but we, we become scared of that thing. And instead, what we start to write is what we think other people, what is the shared experience? What do we think other people want to hear about? Um, and I don't think anybody wants to hear what, a normal ride through Pirates of the Caribbean is like, right? Uh, if you're going to get on the, Pirates of the Caribbean, I want to see it through your eyes, right? What, what does that, what does that mean? Okay. So that's, that's that. Um, some of these things I'm going to have exercises for, um, this, uh, this, the need for completion. Um, I, I think you need to, the, what you need to, to work on here is making it into playtime a little bit more, right? Writing at, at its essence, art as essence is intellectual playtime. And it should be. One of the ways I do this is I keep a, it's not within reach. I keep a, 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 a fiction journal uh, I've talked about a lot and I just write fiction pieces that no one else will see. 
and unless they turn into something that I want other people to see, right? But there's no expectation on my part. It's the most emotionally satisfying thing I do in writing because it's, uh, it has an audience of one person and it's just play. And so I'm saying that then, then I'll, I'll be writing about Disneyland for some reason I'm thinking about it, but there is a reason actually I'm thinking about Disneyland. I don't know why, what it is right now. There's a reason that came to my mind. I have something important to say, some perspective on it that other people don't. Probably has to do with the pandemic and the fact that nobody can go there. I wouldn't go there anyway. I haven't been there in you know, 10, 15, 20 years, something like that. Um, but I, I have something to say. Who knows what it is, right? So I'm just going to let it, let it play out there. Let, let Trust my own talent. Trust my own vision. Trust that I have something fascinating to say. Um, so that's the first need. One that came up uh, for a lot of people was they don't have free time. Um, and uh, people will, will, will condescend to you when you say that and say, mm -hmm. oh, yes, you do. You can find. Well, sometimes you don't. Um, I can tell you that I, I don't write in the month of November. That's when I do Culturama, where I do this um, for 40 hours a week on top of my job, right? And so I, I, I don't have the energy for it. I, I just don't. It's okay. Um, there are times, especially if you're a person with a disability, when it's okay just to have free time. Now, I'm not going to talk about disability very much because I'm not somebody who deals with chronic pain. I'm going to let my wife talk about that. Um, and maybe this is a good time, Anne. Do you think so? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, Okay, why don't you sit next to the microphone? Oh. Make sure everybody can hear you. Okay. And so, um, how, how do you deal with, what, what are some techniques that you've used to get into the artistic process even though you have chronic pain? Yeah, so um, I'm a visual artist, not a writer. Um, and uh, it, it, I, I've taken years off um, from being creative just because you know dealing with pain and emotionally dealing with pain because just dealing with pain on itself it's 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 a thing um and there's a lot of guilt with um like if you're a painter you you're buying huge canvases and filling them with paint and if it doesn't turn out right then you know what do you do so um just somebody that doesn't, as someone that doesn't have a lot of energy, I, I went to, I, I really thought about the kind of stuff I wanted to do. Um, and really what I, I like is drawing. So, so to translate that with writing is I would, I would look at what kind of form is the most interesting to me. Um, and I work really small. So here, here's an example of one of the things I do. I, I really like nature. Yeah. I really like drawing leaves. But this is three inches by four inches. And this is kind of the thing that I do most often is this type of um, small, small piece. And I think the most, the, the, the biggest thing that works for me is I found something that works for me both in form and in size. Um, and I, I think that's kind of what you wanna do. Instead of looking at how other people do it, you have to really figure out what works for you What's gonna let you do something to completion? Like John was talking about a little while ago, give you that sense that you finish something and yet it's, it's enough, you know? So I, I frame these little guys up and they've actually been like my biggest seller. Yeah. So, you know, it is something that, that other people like, that's not necessarily the whole reason why I do it, but um, it is important. I, I think for, for me, at least, it's been to find the thing that, that works that I could actually do, um, feel good about, and um, feel a sense that I'm I'm growing in my art. Also, um, it's not I'm not doing the exact same thing over and over again. I'm I'm growing each time I I do a new drawing, but it also um, doesn't exhaust me um, to do it. So I'm I'm able to do, um, you know, a, a few of these a day if I if I choose to, which um, you know, that I think John's going to talk a little bit more about finding, finding time for stuff. Um, but, but finding a, a form and a medium that works for you is, I think, a, a really good way to um, make it so when you're doing your art, it's, it's something that you, you're able to finish what you start. Okay. That's great.
Thank you, Annie. Um, so An Anne's a, a working artist with chronic pain. If you are a working artist of any kind with chronic pain, she's a good person to talk to. Yeah, I'm on uh, Facebook, so friend me on Instagram. Okay, so um, okay, so that 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 that's one of those things. Uh, if, if you have have a don't have time, um, what she she does a lot is focus on small pieces. Actually, I, I do too. Um, a, a really big thing to make sure that she, she always does is she, she has number one, a spot for her work. Um, and I would say that the hardest part of about me going to the gym and working out is putting on my gym shoes. By far, that's the most difficult, right? Once I'm there, you know, there's the treadmill, I get on the treadmill and I think I'm only gonna do five minutes and I end up doing half an hour. Great. Um, you know, but that, that getting off the couch and putting on your shoes is really difficult. Having a spot, is also really, really important. Um, so the, where, where you can go and knowing that you're going to go to that spot is, is tremendously important as well. So for, for me, uh, th that spot changes. Um, uh, sometimes it's, uh, it used to be on the bus. I don't ride the bus anymore. Uh, sometimes it'll be in my office at work. And then um, I, I have an office partner so if the office partner ha decides to have the same office hours that I do, that stops. Right now, it's it's I've got a particular place. It's right here, actually. Here's my bed. Here's my my actually my gym is right here. Um, I'm surrounded, but this spot is dedicated to, to writing, and it's always set up to do that. So all I have to do is sit down. I don't have to do that. And spot is right down over there. We live in a in a loft, so I'm looking down there, and it's already set up. She's got her board ready. She's going to sit down and, and do that. Um, at times in my life, I haven't had the um, wealth to have. A, a spot as big as a desk. Okay, well then uh, I'm gonna work on my bed in, in a certain way. I'm gonna work on, but it, it's just a place I know that I can go to so that I can get into that, uh, into that intellectual space. I also have to have a specific time to, to work. Uh, and the reason I have to have a specific time, two things. Um, first, I need to know that, um, I, I need to know when that is. Otherwise I will fill it up with other people. And I, I will fill it up with other, other needs and other responsibilities. So um, I, I like to, to do it early in the morning. Um, and, uh, oh, the second reason is biorhythms. Um, and biorhythms is something we don't talk about much anymore. But uh, when I was young, I used to like to write late at night. And I, you know, I just had, had more creative juice then. I don't have creative juice late, late at night anymore. For me now, it's the earlier, the better. So I, I, I like to get up at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. Um, and uh, work for a little while. Then I walk a half mile over to Starbucks and I read, read at Starbucks for a while um, because that's another place where nobody is right now. I'm vaccinated uh, and I get to be in a, in a spot alone. When the kids start coming back, I, I won't be there anymore because they're, they're, they're having their lives, and, but it's very distracting to me. Um, but you, you see what I'm saying, a time and a place, and that, that's great. Now that, that, that time and place, um, I try to keep as, as sacred as possible um, but like today, I, I couldn't, I couldn't do it because I was pre preparing for this. Um, and there's certain days that I'm going to do it and it's okay. Um, yeah, we, 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 we get into shame spirals. It used to be what I would do is I'd say, okay, well, I missed my hour today, tomorrow I'll do two hours. That's a big mistake. Um, because then you miss another day, it's three hours. And then suddenly it's, it's like, you've got this excessive burden. Uh, it's like people who are, who successfully lose weight when they make a mistake, when they eat too much. The next day they don't starve themselves, right? That's not a way to be successful at, at weight loss. It, this binging purging thing doesn't work. Uh, I just try to keep it as much as possible. Um, I also try to take um, odd little moments out, uh, right? I, 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 you know, I have a big problem with writer's movies as well. Uh, I don't like teacher movies. I don't like writer's movies or artist movies for, the same, for all the same reason. When, when I, you know, I, I have this idea of visual artists and it's always, you know, the person with the hair and the, maybe a hat and splashing paint all over. I mean, I watched Pollock and it was a great movie and he's doing all this stuff. And then every time I've ever seen a, a, a visual artist work, it's not that, right? It's, it's uh, they, they come up and they, they work for a little while and say, oh, it's kind of neat. And they walk away and it's like, oh, wow, that, that was brilliant and not emotional in the way that I thought it was going to be at all. And we have the same thing with writers' movies. The, the writer sits down and has really beautiful ideas and you know struggles oh, right it doesn't have to be that it, it's uh so what, what it can also be is like we sit down we work for a little while it's like, yeah it's interesting let's see if this works in this way and i can work for five minutes i can work for three hours right whatever works so that i'm often fitting things in between other things um uh, often at, at, at when i'm teaching 
I will have a class end 43 minutes before the next one starts. Okay, well, that, that's 10 minutes of writing I can do if I feel like it that day. That, that, that works, right? I'm, I'm fitting things in with, with other things. Um, okay, so what were, what were some of the other problems people have? Um, oh, there, there's, um, one of the things I do too is I know what my emotional triggers are, right? I, one of the things I have to be is responsible to other people. If I, make a, if I, if I say something, I will do that for that other person, right? Which is, it's good and it's bad. It's, it's part of my puritanical past, I think. Um, uh, oh, we got a, a nice, nice long one here. I'm gonna do this. Uh, it's part of my puritanical past and I don't think I can get rid of it. Um, even though in some, some ways I know it's unhealthy. So instead of getting rid of it, I make myself, uh, I make it part of how I write. Uh, so for example, um, I know that if I, promise something to a student, I will fulfill that thing. So I promised my students right now that we'll have an hour a day from 9 a.m. till 10 a.m. called shut up and write time, where they have to come and shut up and write. And I have to come and shut up and write too, is a good example. I've just given myself an hour a day of writing, right? Uh, on top of whatever writing I do, I've given that self to my, and I have to do it because I promised my students. I'm a bad teacher now if I don't do that. That works really well for me because uh, I, I am responsible to other people. A lot of us feel this responsibility to other people. Uh, my friend Robert Peluso is a writer, and he just got on the tenure track uh, at our college. He's great. He's, he's, he's uh, actually just got tenure. So he's, he's really great. And he just had a child uh, about 10 years ago. He just had a child. And so like he's like, you know, you've got a kid under 10 and you're working towards tenure. When do you write? Well, he realized that the thing that really works for him is being a parent. And so he started to write stories to his daughter every night. And now he's got a, um, a children's book, essentially, that he's writing. It's a really great thing. It's a superhero. And the father has no superhero powers and the daughter has no superhero powers. But when they're together, they've got this tremendous superhero power, right? And it's the idea of coming together with your, with your parents and children and helping each other. It's a really beautiful story. Um, and so that, that's, that's how he's using the things that are difficult in his life that make it difficult to write it into an advantage. Okay, I'm just going to read some of the chats here. I'm also a visual artist and, and have difficulty settling on a subject, although I've narrowed to a medium for most of my work, which is acrylic. I have the greatest trouble finishing either a poem or painting, letting go of them. Framing does help with paintings. Sending the poems uh, out helps with the writing, even if I may keep revising as poems keep getting rejected. I think that's absolutely true, right? Um, framing works, sending, sending stuff out. Um, some of the stuff, I, I, I never send anything out unless I feel it's done. Sometimes it's not done, right? Sometimes I've made a mistake. The great thing is there's editors who will tell me. Um, and uh, one of my good friends is David Caddy who, who edits Tears in the Fence. Um, and one of his best re rejection letters is what the hell's wrong with you, right? And then he explained what the hell was wrong with me all the way through. Uh, it, was, it was, you know, a bad ending. But it was, it was a real gift, right? Because he was, he was then... Rejection in that case is a gift because that story was actually it was a story with the fourteen-year-old and twenty-four-year-olds. He he was like he took a look at that and said that this is absolutely wrong. It's creepy as hell. What's wrong with you? It's like oh okay you're, you're right um, and that saved me and also got me a good story right. Um, and so that 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 being ready to send it out is, is is a really good thing. We all fear rejection, and rejection sucks. Um, you can take a little bit of the edge off of rejection though. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say this, and everybody in here who's an editor is going to be really angry at me for saying this. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm talking to writers, not editors right now. Um, if, if you're really afraid of rejection, send to some places you know will reject you. Send the most inappropriate stuff that you can to the, the to, to magazines. Send a poem to the New York Times. They're going to reject you. Send an erotic story to, to highlights. Don't do that. No, that's, that's bad. Oh, no. Yeah, no, don't do that. But, you know, uh, go, go, do, then you're going to get rejected and you're going to realize it's not, it's not as necessarily as bad as it, it still sucks. It's, there's not, never a moment in which you say, Oh, got to reject, you know? Um, but it, 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 that, that sort of thing that, that can help you. Hey, Robin. Um, okay. Somebody else said, uh, Alyssa said, I know somebody had trouble finding a space. So she would write, she'd do writing playlist in a candle. Um, she paired, this music and candle so much that eventually when she smelled it and heard it, she was, she was ready to write. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Music does that to you, doesn't it? Um, and smells do too. I've, I've never, I've never found a good way of doing that. There, there's, there's studies that say that 
if you can get your students to smell the same thing and then take the test and spray that smell, it's great. But I can't figure out a way of doing that in my classes. I've been trying for the last 20 years. <coughs> uh, the, worst re um, the worst rejection I received was one in which they contained only one word, sorry. I still have that somewhere. Yeah, that's kind of suck. Um, that's great, Luis, that the ideas just, or Jose, that the ideas just keep coming. Um, uh, just recognizing that PTSD and pain can block my creativity for a while helps a lot. Um, yeah, letting go, letting go of the need to write and letting myself have grace just to exist something that's been helping me. Um, absolutely. Um, PTSD is a, is a real thing and it affects a lot of writers. It's a lot of the reason that a lot of us write. Um, it, it, we, we are working through some sort of emotional something. Um, actually, I want to talk about that. Um, th that was one of the questions that I got on the Facebook um, thing that I did. Uh, oh, what, what do you do with trauma when you start to experience trauma? That's a real thing. And you, you've been here and I've, I've, I've worked with Ken, who's a trauma psychotherapist. We always start this way. Do not work on trauma by yourself, right? This, what, what you're dealing with is, is really dangerous and you need to be, you need to have that, that thing. I, a therapist, absolutely. Um, if you don't, don't go for therapy, then priest, um, people in your, your life, you need that support system. The people who are actually going to support and help you. But simply writing it out can put you absolutely back into that that space of trauma. You can re, you you will you will start to re-experience that that trauma. So now Ken, who uh, fought in um, Vietnam and was a firefighter and was a second responder to 9/11, knows what he's talking about, and he does not go into this by himself. Right? Make sure you're working with that. Um, if you're dealing with this sort of thing, sometimes it's, it's better just to write the sort of dream time fiction journal, right? Go, going in the, until you can get to the place where you can, you can write about it. I, I don't think though that uh, like, um, I had a friend who was, um, he was, he was a Navy SEAL and he'd become a writer and he had, he had, uh, fought in Panama. Um, and he kept, he was writing fantasy novels and uh, that were not, not doing very well. Um, but he kept kept writing them because he, he enjoyed them. And so he said, well, why don't you just write about Panama? So, well, that's the day that I saw my four best friends die and it's the worst day of my life. I don't want to keep reliving that. that that's fair, right? Um, he, he eventually got to the point where he could, he could write about it, but it took him a very long time. Um, yeah, uh, let's see. Um, making writing something that... that um, yeah, religion and, and therapy absolutely helps. Um, uh, making yourself beholden to other people. Uh, often, sometimes I'll have dinner parties at my house, not in the last year, but before that. Um, and sometimes the reason I have a few people come over is my house is really messy and I want to clean it and I just can't get the energy to clean it. So I invite people over, then I have to clean it, right? And so so finally I, I get I get off the couch and I, I do that. Um, and, and, and that, 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 you can do the same thing with, with, with writing and that's by setting deadlines and <coughs> telling people that you're around you that you, you can work with them. I very much believe in writing groups. Um, I, had a, I had the hardest time finding a writing group in Los Angeles because in Los Angeles, um, I'm everybody's dad. And so it, it you know, like uh, you, you can't tell dad, you know, there's so many emotions when somebody's trying to, so I had to go to Fresno. I'm, I'm in a writing group with Bonnie. Um, so I could get away from, from, um, uh, my, my kids for a while, um, kids who are often 30 years older than I am. Uh, but you know, it, it's, it's, it's that, that sort of, that sort of relationship. I, 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 and I believe it's necessary to have that kind of, uh, group of people for most people, uh, in part to keep you hopeful in part to keep you motivated so that you, you have something to do. Why is our dad rejecting us? That's right. Uh, <laughs> Um, and making, making those commitments are good now, but it's very important also that you're choosing the right group. Um, and I know Jose and Will, you're having a little bit of difficulty because, um, your, your, your group leader just passed away and she was a friend of mine. She's, she's a great person. Um, let's describe the kind of group that mo works for most people. Most people, about five people in a group works, um, more than that. And you're, you're talking about a lot of time, less than that. And it's not a lot of input. Um, D yeah, accountability, absolutely. Um, uh, d the person who's just a jerk, that's not part of my group, right? I'm really looking for someone who actually has constructive things to say. The person who's only going to say nice things to make me feel good about myself, that, that's the person to have coffee with later, 
that, that's another person to be in your group. Somebody who, who knows what they're talking about, has about the same experience as you. That's, that's, that's the group that you, that's the people in the group that you want. It's people who are going to speak truth. And by truth, I mean, what's truly there, not say randomly mean things because it's fun to say randomly mean things, right? That exists too. Um, I personally made a list of people in my life who I could bring my, my stuff to, right? Um, and there, that I eliminate most people. Um, uh, family members eliminate altogether. You got to go where the love is, not where it's supposed to be, right? Um, and some people who are, are there are going to knock you down. Uh, let's see, some resistance. Oh, yeah. Yeah, making is the deepest realm of knowledge. Um, you, you absolutely do not need to produce. Uh, yeah, now important is how important is the diversity of voices within the group? I think it's very important. Um, I, I think uh, I don't want to be talking to myself. Um, I, so I, I don't. I, I've got a lot of guys, people in my my who look just a lot like me, but that's not what my my writing group is going to look like. I hope. I think you want to have as as much diversity as you can making sure that everyone in the group is about the same skill, experience level, that, that kind of thing. So I, I absolutely believe in, in writing groups that look as different as possible. Now with the Zoom, um, isn't it wonderful that we've had this quarantine in some ways? Um, it's taught us how to, to reach out to other people in different parts of the world. And I think that that's a, that's a really great thing. It's given us the ability to, to work with other people. Um, Okay, so here are some other things that people were worried about. Um, fear of what other people will think of you. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean, that, 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 that's a huge thing. We all have these voices in our head. Um, I, I can remember early experience. I, I, I took an IQ test. First of all, IQ tests are bullshit. Um, but I took an IQ test and um, I, I scored high. And one of the, the, the adults in my life said, that's, that's inaccurate. That's not you. Right, um, you know, so you're you're a fine person, but you're just not all that bright, right? Is what they were saying, um, and so okay, that, that that's a voice that goes along with me for the all, all my time, and I'm I'm sometimes I, I put out stuff and people dislike it, and I'm afraid of that, right? I'm, I'm a human being, um, and uh, so number one, submit to places that you know you're you're going to be rejected from. Um, make a list of people that you feel comfortable sharing these things with and really feel comfortable sharing things with. I mean, not, not the people that you're supposed to feel comfortable, people that actually, and who also want to see what you're doing, right? There's a lot of people I feel comfortable with, but <coughs> me giving them stuff is an imposition to them. Um, and I should be ready also to, to look at their stuff back. Um, and um, what's the last thing? Oh yeah. Me, me, then, then, um, uh, understanding that what you have to say is interesting and important and, and matters, right? It's not going to look like what other people have, have to say. It's going to look like what you have to say. Um, okay. So trying to work through some of these others. <coughs> um, depression. Um, somebody asked what, what happens if you're, if you're a person dealing with depression? Well, <coughs> I think absolutely you need to work with a th therapist on that. Um, uh, the, but the writing will help. Um, having the an overblown expectation of your writing however will not uh help you uh so that if you're thinking okay well if i if i get this out um I, i'll suddenly not be depressed that's not true it might help a little bit um but it's not gonna it's not some sort of panacea uh diversity is necessary at least a developed sense of empathy yeah that's that's true cello um somebody was um afraid that they're not going to find, find a publisher. Uh, and I think that's, that's a legitimate fear. And this desire you have to publish work is a good desire, right? There's nothing wrong with that. A lot, a lot of people will condescend and say, well, just don't worry. No, that you've, you've got this desire. You, you want to get your, your, your word out there. You want to get your voice out there. I think that's good. I think a really great thing, though, is now there are so many more publishers than have ever been in the history of the world. Um, a bigger concern is, am I going to be, make money? That you might not make any any a good deal of money on it, but I certainly think there there are publishers out there for just about everybody. Um, you know, when it was first starting, we were looking at the at the big six and them those people only. We now have a, a whole bunch of other types of publishers. There are not just mag magazines that exist on bookstore shelves. There are are magazines everywhere. If you look through 
um, do a trope. You know, you'll see how many how many publishers are are, are out there. Um, but I think when you're writing, you don't think about the publishing. When you're writing, you think about telling whatever it is that you need to tell, and just know that there are going to be things out there uh, to help you. Uh, know also there are mentors that will help you to to find your publisher. That's one of the things that I do, and I'm happy to help you find your publishers. Um, so if you come, if you bring the stuff that you want to publish to me, I will I will tell you exactly where it should go, uh, or at least where I think it should go. Uh, okay, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna break in a second so we can you can start asking questions. Um, somebody said, I feel like I have no talent. Um, well, there, that, that, there is um, a talent for writing is not the same thing as talent for playing piano, right? It's a different, different thing altogether. I, I think that there are certain people who simply cannot play the, the piano. Um, uh, I, I include myself as one of those people. Also, I'll, I'll never be able to sing because when I do, it sounds like somebody strangling a cat. Um, but, but writing is different, right? Writing is, is, um, uh, there, there, there's a certain type of talent that some people have, um, and the, they'll have a talent for voice. Not everybody, ha not everybody has a talent for voice. Not everybody ha has a talent for seeing interesting stories. Not everybody has the same talent, but there's so, so many different things that, yeah, you absolutely have talent in this. You're not going to sound like Jim Harrison, right? If you've ever read Jim Harrison, Beautiful writing, amazing writing. You will never sound like Jim Harrison, but Jim Harrison will never sound like you, right? And so that, that's an important thing to say, to, to think about. Uh, talent for, for writing, I, 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 think, I think I'm onto something here that artistic genius is the ability to listen, or at least writing genius is the ability to listen, right? And once you're able to listen to yourself, you can draw out those things that are really great about your writing. And, you know, so, so I, I what, what, are, what are things that I, I I have a pretty good sense of sentence structure. I have a pretty good voice, right? Things that I don't do well, I can't, I don't do very well in writing a long story, right? It's, it's not, doesn't appeal to me very much. I, I've done it a couple of times, but I'm not, I'm not terribly good. It doesn't mean I don't have artistic or writing um, talent, right? I think almost everybody has that, that writing talent. Just finding your own niche and what it is that you're supposed to be writing. That's, that's the thing. Um, Okay, let's see, what else? Um, constant interruptions, somebody is saying. Um, I think that, that uh, that's absolutely true, especially with parents. I get constant interruptions as well. Um, I, I have the, some of the worst habits. I leave Facebook on, I leave, um, when I'm writing, I leave on um, uh, uh, my email. And so I'm constantly being barraged by people and say, oh, well, this, I've got to answer that person. That, person's, that person matters. Uh, well. Um, I, f first of all, what I really should do is, is, uh, turn, turn that stuff off. Um, uh, number one, um, what did we say about this? Um, uh, I, I also work while other people sleep. Um, so I'm, I'm usually up pretty early. Uh, I, I work, I work when I know other people will not want to interrupt me. As I said, I, I, I wake up most mornings at four o'clock in the morning and I'll start working at, at that point. Cause I, I, I know that, um, my department chair, who's also one of my closest friends, is not going to email me at, at four o'clock in the morning because she doesn't like to wake up before 10. Um, so great. That's perfect. I, I, I'm now, now not doing, doing that. Um, I think it's also, I, I've, it, this, this is a, an easy thing to say. Um, other people's whims are not more important than your, your needs, right? So people will come with, to you with a whim and say, well, could you just help me out for an hour and a half? It's like, well, no. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's okay to say, now that's an easy thing to say until you were confronted with, I think it's, it's a harder thing to, to proceed with. Um, and there's just a couple more before I wanted to get, um, somebody said getting sucked into political drama. Now I, I posted this question in February and there was uh, much more political drama in February uh, than there is now. Uh, but that, that's another reason I, I've, I've, I've banned myself from CNN.com for the time being because I, I, I can't stop looking at that stuff and you know what's going to happen next. And back in November, it was a much worse habit for me. Um, oh, the danger of, of seeing it as, as a hobby, right? Uh, the, if you see it as a hobby, we have undervalued hobbies. Here's what I, I have to say about, about art and writing. Um, it's there to serve you. It's not the other way around. Um, art and writing is, is there to, to work toward your benefit. If you, if it, that means it's a hobby, 
that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with having a hobby. There's nothing wrong with doing those things that you love to do simply because you love to do them. That, that it's great if you're going to publish. I think that's wonderful. I want to see it. If you don't want to, that's great too, right? Uh, and I'll give you the world's best teacher for, for that, for, for writing uh, for without an audience is uh, Sid Bartman extraordinary uh, journaling teacher. I've never seen anybody like her. She was, she was my uh, professor back in 91. And now uh, somehow I'm 20 years older than she is. I don't know how that happened. She, she, she stayed 35 for the last uh, 30 years. Um, yeah, th there will also be a break at that time, Tiffany. Um, okay, so, uh, but, but I, I, wanted to, I wanted to just take a break from talking right now and see if anybody had any questions or any comments about like, this is the thing that keeps me, prevents me from writing. And please don't say nothing prevents me from writing. I, I, I celebrate you if that's true, but th that's not what we're focused on right now. Um, when life takes terrible twists and turns for years and keeps you from your passion of writing. Yeah, absolutely. That's a thing that happens to a lot of people, if not everybody, right? Um, when, when that the life is, is going badly, well, it's always there waiting for you too, right? It, first, if you, if you've been away from it for a while, it'll be, it'll be hard to get back in. Um, after November, every December, it's hard for me to get back in. It used to be April. So I used to say every May, it's hard for me to get back into writing. I know I won't write during that time. Uh, I give myself the, the, the freedom to write terrible crap for as, as long as I need to, right? Um, I, I, to, I'm not only allowing myself to write ter terrible crap in early December, that's what I'm aiming for. It's going to be bad. Okay. Let's, let's write as bad as I can. The, the, let, let, let's do that. Um, and I think that's great when you're getting back into writing, I think that it's, it's okay to do that. And it's okay to write about the, the, the terrible twists and turns that your, your life has been going through, right. Or whatever that is. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of what sort of things. Oh yeah. I had the shingles one time. I got so stressed out that I got the shingles and I had it for about three months. I was like, uh, but now I have something to write about. It's, uh, you know, I've got the, uh, the shingles could be the, the, the most, the, the dullest thing to write about. And actually it might be very, very interesting too. And Kelly, you have your hand up. Yeah. So I wanted to, sorry, I've got some construction going on here. I'll mute in just a second. Um, what I'm trying to, I have a novel draft and parts of it are good and parts of it are just so horrible. I know that one of the reasons I haven't tapped back into it is because I'm looking at the mountain. I'm looking at all of the work I know needs to get done instead of looking at sort of just what is the next little thing I can do on it to make progress. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, I think um, some women can chime in on this one, not feeling that I deserve to take the time needed to do that work. I've got so many other things going on. It's like I've put myself out for everybody. Okay, now I'll mute. <laughs> Yeah, I think that, that that's great. And I, I didn't hear any of your background uh, stuff. Um, uh, so, yeah, um, I, I, I actually will ask women to, I don't want to mansplain anything here. So um, I've done that too much, too often in my life. Um, but th that mountain of stuff in front of you is is really difficult. Um, and I, I, I think of it this way. When I, when I revise, I try to turn my paragraphs into poems. Right. And I try to work in, in that way so that I'm working. Um, I'm not trying to see the whole thing. I'm trying to figure out what is the beautiful thing about this and make that as beautiful as I, as I possibly can. Right. Um, and uh, that, that takes it off a little bit. It, it makes it makes that moment pleasurable so that it's not all about the product. It's about the the gorgeous process as well. Um, now, I, I, I don't want to mansplain. So I'm wondering if, if women can chip, chime in here about about this who, who has good advice for her yeah bonnie i think one thing that helps is if you can and it depends on the details of your life of course if you can have a certain place maybe a certain drink tea maybe water if you could do that and you know and you think of it as work and you say i'm going into work now I don't know your situation. If I knew it a little better, I could tell you. And John would not be mansplaining on this because he's helped lots of women. <laughs> um, it, it, it's more about if you can just know that you're going to do this uh, and you know, don't disturb mm -hmm. it. Do you have your own office? Just, you can just nod yes or no. Do you have a room, a place where you work? 
Yeah, except for now I have my daughter's kitten in the room. <laughs> so oh, that's so it had been my, my space, that's but I see what crazy. you mean of, of, of like, you know, telling everybody it's like I have a meeting. I have a Zoom at four o'clock uh -huh. and then yes. just go in and take that time. When my best friend got her book deal, Hazel Dixon Cooper, I think she just joined us. Um, she, uh, her quote friend from high school who no longer exists because we blew her off the face of the earth. She, uh, Hazel had a book deadline. She'd never written a book before. She had to do this. It was money. And her friend called. She would work all day at work, go home, fix dinner. She had a daughter at home then um, in school. And then this friend, about eight o'clock, when Hazel would sit down to work, this friend would call. Hi, how are you? What's new? What's going on? And it, she had a real problem. And she talked to me about it. And I didn't know then a lot, but I said, don't talk to her. Don't talk to her. You're working. And, you know, if you can just say I'm working, people hear that better. You know, I'm going into work for an hour. I'm going into work for an hour. Or I'm going into work for a while. And then if they're a little bit, I mean, a kitten's a wonderful thing. That energy is going to be great. Uh, but also let it be known that you can get your own coffee or tea. You don't need anybody bringing you food. Fire, flood, or blood. Only reasons to bother you. So I hope that helps you because it's just sometimes just how you how you say it. Yeah, yeah. You, there's a couple of things that I realized about myself and I wish I'd realized this when I was a student. First thing is I'm a, a very highly kinesthetic learner, which meaning that I have to move and see I'm, I'm holding a pen right now in order to think. Um, and part of my writing process is I find a room of my own, which is often the sidewalk outside. And when I'm walking, that's part of my work time, right? I'm, I'm walking around. So that, that's me figuring out my own self. I'm also an, a, a very extroverted person and people take that to mean stupid. It's not stupid. It means I, I, I need to be around people. Um, and that, that, that's, I feel energy when I'm around people. So going down to Starbucks, even when there's kids sometimes is, is, is a useful thing as well. Um, and so what, what I'm saying is find those things that also work for you in addition to everything that Bonnie said. Um, so um, whatever that is, a room of one's own is, is an exceptionally important thing or a space of one's own. Um, uh, and Kelly, you had your hand up before you took it down. Um, I, I wanted to share something that's kept me from writing, which is that I have a lot of negative self-talk when I write that I'm like kind of barely aware of, except that at the end of the writing session, I just feel like crap and I don't really know why. And I'm working on this now. I actually, I'm lucky enough to have a therapist and she recommended um, trying to actually get that negative self-talk talk out on paper so that I can address it directly instead of it just kind of floating around in my head and being believable that I write it down on the paper like you, this isn't going to be perfect and then you can look at that and be like well that's not really a problem is it you know so to get it out of yourself and make it conscious instead of subconscious and then you can address it and for me I bring it back to my therapist and I go like help me with this please but um so that's just it, it ties in a lot with what, what you were saying but for me it's that experience of just feeling like crap afterwards that I had to address because I didn't want to go back to writing if it always made me feel that bad. Yeah, so that's a really good point. And then negative self-talk will, will kill you. And if you're always going back to the, those traumatic parts of your life too, that that's like, why would you ever want to write then? I was like, that's just, that'd be horrible. Um, but but yeah, I mean, uh, the negative self-talk I think is is true for a lot of people. Um, we sit around talking about, talking to ourselves about how, how awful we are. And um, I'm not sure why that is. I do know that it helps to be in a group. Um, uh, get the, as, as Bonnie would say, the validation, uh, right? And you get people who, are, who are, keep you focused and say, you know what, the stuff you're doing is, is actually interesting. And I, I, want, I want to read more of it. Um, okay. Um, we have, after joining a generative group, which I resisted that meets once a week, I find that I can set aside. I'm sorry? I'm, I'm going to pop. I'm going to mute you there. Um, I find that I can set aside time um, uh, and have done this deliberately to write for 20 minutes on a prompt of my choice, maybe a couple more times a week. Earlier, I'd not write for long periods. Having community uh, was jumpstart. And I think that's really great. A, a generative uh, writing group is a really, really good thing. 
to, to, to have. Um, and so often when I'm in writing groups, it'll be both um, revision and generation as well. It's hard for me to, like I, I, I wrote the um, biograph biographical stuff that everybody writes, and then you get to your second story and what, what do you do? Um, a lot of that stuff that's inside me that's, that's deep and powerful and meaningful is deep inside me. I'm not sure exactly what it is. Um, and I, I, I need something to help me access that. And uh, I, I'll, I'll do that very often with um, uh, ekphrasis. If you stay for, for the, the generative workshop after this, we're gonna be working with just one painting today. But uh, so I'll show, look at a painting and I'll write about the painting and that, that can help trigger stuff in my own my own consciousness. I'm working right now on Inland Empire uh, painters, um, Milford Zorns being, being one that I'm focusing on. But there's all sorts of, of, of people you could look for. Okay, what other questions do you have? What other uh, things? Uh, Luis, or, I'm sorry, I see your middle name, Jose. Okay, one of the situations that I had, I use an iPad and I love my iPad just pages, but I was still having technical problems. And then my daughter got on my case. He said, no, no, use Word. And I use Word on the iPad, but it was horrible. But I mm. use my desktop, and man, it's the best program to use to write. So you sort to start retyping into Word what I did in iPad. We're talking about 50,000 words and things like that. That's why I've been writing. Because somebody mm. told me a good novel is over 60, 90,000 words. Not, otherwise, it will be a small, uh, you know, uh, story. So that's what my problem was. And thank God to my daughter. She has a great instinct about writing. You, you know, it's, it's interesting. A lot of people, they'll, they'll talk about this as being the, the, the problem. It, it, these things that seem minor, but they're not. Um, like uh, somebody was saying that he does does drawings. And the thing that stops him the most is is cutting the paper because he's got to cut it by six to six by nine or something. So there's some specific thing. And it's just so frustrating and annoying for him to never get started. And for me, I've got a lot of teacher things like this. I've got some writer things like this that are just so frustrating and get started. And I realize what those things are. It helps me to work through that. Um, the thing that, that bothers me the most about my given profession, which is uh, community college education, is the times when people stop me from doing mean, meaningful work, right? When I have to sit around doing unmeaningful things because the people I'm working with really need the help, right? And I can really help them. And, but often I'm asked to do pointless paperwork. I have this paperwork. Uh, one time I turned in grades, it was 110 pages worth of, of a stack of 110 pages of grades I had to do, wherein I had to, for most of it, I had to write what was on the back of the sheet onto the front of the sheet, right? Instead of helping people achieve things at that point, I was doing that. And it made me really, really angry. Um, that's, that, that sort of stuff is really triggering to me. And I find that, that when um, I'm having to do that stuff as a writer, it's triggering to me again. And I don't want to do it, right? And, um, but what I did is I, I, what helps me a little bit with that is identified what the problem is and why I don't want to be doing this stuff. Why does it keep me? Well, because it puts me back in that emotional space where I'm doing a hunt over a hundred pages of, of sheets for just to turn in my grades. And instead of doing something that actually matters to somebody. Um, and so once I identified, it helps a little bit, you know, it doesn't make it totally, but those small things I think are emblematic of larger things, right? So you're using a, a, an iPad and you want to use an iPad, right? And, um, why don't you want to use, well, who knows? Maybe you can talk your way through it and say, oh, I don't want to use Word for this reason. It helps to, and that'll, that'll help you get, get through that. And by the way, I don't think there's anything wrong with using an iPad. I think I've never used one myself, but it seems like a great device. Um, John? Yeah. Yeah, I, I just to go on to, to kind of go on to that is I use my computer. I use my iPad sometimes and I use pen and paper. So you can use any whatever of that works. or all of it, whatever works, yeah. And just identifying what, why you're being triggered by something, I think it's, it's really helpful. Uh, somebody uses their phone a lot. My God, I would hate that. Rosaline, I would so hate using my phone, but I'm not you and that's okay. It's okay that we are two different people. Um, I, I, I can't stand being around phones. I hate phones. Everything about the phone, it makes me angry. Um, but you like it, so more power to you. Um, that, that's great. It used to be, uh, we said, well, you, you've got to have create a connection between you and paper and that that creates an emotional bond and you know all this stuff well that's true for a lot of people it's not true for everybody um the, people who have grown up without pen and paper don't have that emotional 
attachment to their pen and paper. Um, it's great. It's fine. Uh, it, it, it's shocking to me uh, what people have grown up with and what they've grown up with without now, because I, I grew up writing with a pen and paper. Um, and I, found, I find my, my, my my most intelligent students now don't know how to fill out uh, an, an address for an envelope. They just have no idea how to do that. Why would they? You know, they were born in 2000. They don't know what, they don't know what this is. Okay, oh, my coordination after my last surgery made it hard to type. I had to really work through this frustration. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, th there's, there's nothing about that, right? You're just gonna have to do that. I'm trying to catch up on some of this stuff. Oh, people are talking about the technology that works for them. Absolutely. What are the other things stopped you? What other questions do you have? I think Kelly, you've got a comment. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, um, I have tried using voice texting and using that on my iPad or on my phone because I also have had some problems where at the end of the day of work, I just could not type anything anymore. And it takes a little getting used to. Um, uh, I set up some stuff on my, my laptop as well. Uh, you have to do some strange things if you're, um, like if you want a paragraph break and you have to uh, say what kind of punctuation you want. So you'd have to say something like, the cat sat down, period. <laughs> You, know, you have to put in the punctuation there. Uh, but for some people, if that's if, if there's a physical struggle with doing it, that might help. And, and like I said, at least it gets you the sort of the first draft in. It's not perfect, but um, but I find it's uh, much better now than it was even just two or three years ago. Yeah, and it, it, the technology for that's getting better and better. If you can see at the top, I've, I've got uh, for, for people hard of hearing, I've got Otter AI and it's almost it's gotten, it's gotten to know my voice, so it gets me almost perfectly. By the way, if you have trouble hearing, click on that. It'll, it'll help you. It'll, it has live transcription. A uh, really good friend of mine recently became um, uh, almost quadriplegic. He, um, he, he, can, well, he can move his thumb, right? I mean, he's, it's, he's, so the iPad and works for him. He can use the iPad, but the, the voice text thing really help, works for him. And so now he's, he's stopped doing what he's doing and he's, he's going on to uh, get a degree in history and he's gonna be a history professor. Um, but it, it's it's because of this stuff, right? Because he's able to use this technology, tech, use all of it. Um, what other things keep you from writing, give you trouble? I absolutely need the kinesthetic process of writing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that works. Okay, I'm going to go back to my list then. Um, feeling that you're not good enough, um, and uh, that that I, th I think comes from also this this idea that um, th there's this these other people who are saying the really important stuff that your lived experience is not interesting, and I I I, I don't think that's true. I think that your lived experience is there. Um, what is it? Typewriter. Yeah. Um, I like the the quill and pen thing too. You can all use a quill. Um, uh, degreelessness. Uh, someone was saying that I don't have any of the degrees that everybody has, and I, I see these people succeeding, and they, I, I just don't have that that MFA or that whatever. Um, I can tell you, as as somebody who does have an MFA, it, it's not in any way necessary, not even remotely necessary. It's not. It, it, it did a good job of teaching me how to teach, and that's really what the MFA is about. Um, uh, yeah, so you can see that degree is, 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 is kind of a receipt, um, but it, it, it helped me to, to teach because that's what we spent a lot of our time talking about. Um, what helped me to write during that time is I had a professor who made me write 100 uh, pages per semester, um, and that, that helped me more than anything. Um, what really helped a lot during that time was they, I, I wanted to be the fiction editor for the, our, our our literary journal that helped me because I, I got to, to to learn what people were doing and what mistakes were being made and I saw my own mistakes there. Um, but in terms, it's not like that you, you sit down and they say you, X, Y, and Z, and suddenly you, you can write. Um, now, and I'm not saying that MFAs are bad. I have one and I've I've taught it a couple of, of MFAs and I, I think they're 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 great. But this idea that you can't write without one is 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 a big mistake. It's danger. Um, yeah, some. What, what's really gonna get you through is some help, some education and having interesting learned experience. The, the place where I had the hardest time teaching people to, to, to write um, were at the UCs and the CSUs. 
Um, and that's because a lot of people there were people who were, uh, this was their first real experience outside the house. Um, I, I, I finally gave the moratorium at Cal State Long Beach. I said, you can no longer write about getting drunk in the dorms. You have to write about some other thing than that. Um, and right, because that, that, that was the one experience basically that they'd had at that, that point. That's what they were writing about. Um, whereas uh, when I've worked with, um, uh, well, when, actually when I worked with, with Nyla and Wayne with your program, like everybody in there had really interesting experiences and all the writing was great, right? Uh, it wasn't, most of these people were returning students uh, with the exception of someone we called young Alex, um, you know, and he was, he was young. Uh, everybody else was not all that young, right? We were all, but everybody had interesting things to say, right? And that, that's, it wasn't the degree that did that. It was the degree that kind of honed your skills to write about it a little bit. Um, and so that's this, this feeling that you're not good enough because you don't have a degree. Please don't do that. That's, I think that's, that's part of, um, I don't know, that's maybe part of, of capitalism or something. Uh, what, my, my degree hasn't made me a better writer than anyone else. Yeah, I, th I think of the great writers who dropped out of school. Steinbeck dropped out of school, right? Uh, he never <laughs> finished his BA. Um, yeah, absolutely. Some of the great writers are, I, I'm, I'm working with this, this young guy right now. He's maybe 25 years old and he's just got finished his master's degree basically on, on homelessness. Um, and he has really interesting things to say about homelessness, right? He's, he's he, he, one of these people who, they, they asked him to live as a homeless person for a little while and then try to understand the experience a little bit better. I don't think that is going to make him understand the experience all, all that well, because, you know, now you're doing it vicariously. Now you're doing it as kind of a project or a vacation. Um, but he does have more than the rest of us to say about this. And so now he's got something to say. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've, 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 Tiffany, you almost dropped out of your MFA program. I have, I have, I have dropped out of three graduate programs, um, and all, all three were good, good choices. Um, doesn't mean they didn't have any value, right? They, they helped me. Um, okay. Um, uh, the, so a lot of people on the Facebook th thing said that they just don't feel that they're good enough. Um, and again, that's, that's comparison. I made one of the worst mistakes in my life uh, when I was about 25. I was on 25 years old. Uh, I was on my honeymoon. And we were in, in, in Steinbeck country up in Salinas and I bought Steinbeck's collected letters and, and it was all of his letters for, for all his life. And I thought, oh, that's cool. I'm just going to, I'm going to read the, all the letters that he wrote when he was 25. I did. When I turned 26, I read those 27. And so, so wait a second, I, I'm 27. Why don't I have a Nobel prize yet? I don't understand. Right. That, that's a, that's a, that's a really bad mistake to compare you to, the, to, the, to other people. Um, Steinbeck would not have done well in our, our time, right? He did well in his time. Um, stop comparing yourself to, to other people and realize that what you have to say is, is brilliant. Um, I wish I had the sense to drive a degree program. Um, I, you know, I don't, Vanessa Red Rose is a good person to be. Um, yeah. In Mexico during the 1700s, there was a child, three year olds who could write legibly. Um, yeah ultimately not getting an MFA. Yeah, I, I, I think, I think uh, an MFA is a, is, a, is a great thing to, to pursue. I don't think it's the only thing to pursue, right? There's, there's, there's nothing wrong with having one. There are many benefits to having one, but don't feel like you're, you're never going to write if you don't have one. One of the most successful writers I know in this life is uh, Bonnie Hearn Hill. And Bonnie, you, you, do you, have an, you don't have an MFA, do you? No, but I, I think that there's a lot to be said for them, and I may end up with one. Uh, and, and what can be said, I think, because look at someone like William Gay, who, who was so well read, but you know, it's one of my husband's favorite writers. I think it's reading. And that's mm -hmm. one of the wonderful things. I'm taking classes right now with Carrie, and we've been forced to read all kinds of stuff. And you're saying, well, why would I want to do that at this stage in my career? Because you have to, it's your blood. And the more you read, um, the better. I was reading that you have a new magazine out that you're editing. I've got to get my hands on a copy of that. The more, the more you read, the more you feed your soul. And cool. so that's, I think, the benefit of that. And I think also it's really important to read modern work, current work. Mm -hmm. um, getting, getting a little bit of echo for somebody. Um, current work, uh, this, which is why I, I try to write um, 50 book reviews a year. Um, and I do it mostly with a magazine called Tears in the Fence. I do some with Cultural Weekly. Um, 
but just to keep myself focused. The reason I do it as reviews is it makes sure that I stay focused and that I have now created an obligation for myself, which means I know I'm gonna, going to read. So yeah, I mean, that, that's a big part of the MFA process is learning how to read and, and, and when to read and all that. Um, and it sounds like we, we're, we're bashing MFAs. I don't wanna bash MFAs. I think they're, they're fine. Yeah, oh, Wayne, talk about somebody who knows MFAs. Well, I, I wanted to just say a couple couple of things. What, the, the best thing about an MFA is that it has a workshop, which is a writer's group. And it's a writer's group that is usually a little more structured than, than most. Not that it says you have to do it this way or that way, but that, for example, people who just love to trash other people's work, uh, on Whitby Island, we used to take them down and throw them in the sound. Good. And after they got dunked a couple of times, because it's 40 degrees in that water, they they decide they shouldn't shouldn't do that. It also gives you it gives you an audience that you know wants to take your work seriously. And that's one of the biggest things that, that we lack. But the other thing about MFAs is that the people in them are just as insecure as the rest of us. One of my major tasks as the program director was to talk two or three students and probably one faculty member off the cliff every semester because they decided they weren't any good. They, they couldn't do it. Somebody else was writing better than they were. And I would just have to, to talk them out of that. And there'd be a one about one faculty member a semester who decided that he or she just couldn't teach, had nothing to say, and I'd have to talk that person off the cliff. I mean, a good MFA has a component where it talks people off the darn cliff. And you've got that interested, responsive workshop. And that, that feeling of not having an audience is the hardest thing for writers. It's the hardest thing for me now. I'm writing this. Is anybody going to want to read it? Uh, is anybody going to want to publish it? And MFA programs help you help get you through that phase, I think. Yeah. And so, okay, so let's, uh, th that you don't have an MFA shouldn't keep you from writing, but also it's not bad to have, have an MFA. I think it's really also important to choose your MFA wisely. Um, they're not the same thing. They're not, not all MFAs are the same. Um, there are vast differences. Uh, the reason I chose mine was uh, a guy named Jerry Lachlan, who was writing this really bizarre stuff that nobody had ever seen before that I loved. And what it turns out he was writing were, were novellas in Flash, which has uh, now become a really big thing. But back in the 70s, nobody else was writing that. Um, you can go to, I, I think a certain person wants the Iowa Writers Workshop experience, but that's not certainly not for everybody. Um, I've sent a couple of students to Emerson, which is great, fantastic thing, but wouldn't have worked for me at all, right? You know, uh, so it's important to find that. Now, Wayne, Wayne ran a really interesting MFA and it was, uh, the faculty was just amazing, like David Wagoneer and, you know, all, all those people up there, which is great. And I think that worked for a lot of people for, for exactly doing that, that thing, having that group. Um, if anybody would like to talk about MFAs and getting into MFAs and getting the, getting the MFAs to pay you rather than you pay them, just talk to me personally. If, uh, that's, that's something that you can do. Um, and it just depends on where you're going um, as to what you're, as what you're going to get. Um, if you're looking for a low res MFA right now, and I, I'm, I'm just looking at the people I know who are thinking of that. Um, I really like Antioch University. I think they, they run a really great program. Wayne, do you have better advice than, than that? Um, now, I, I think you just have to look real carefully at it, and it's not the reputations of the writers. Uh, if you can get in touch with some former students or current students, uh, for us, our best advertising was our alumni and our current students. Mm. They, they were bringing new students to us uh, much more effectively than any, anything else we, we did. But, but don't just go by the writers. Sometimes, as with us, the biggest name we had was David Wagner, and he was probably the most brilliant teacher that we had. Uh, but I've, the MFA program I did, uh, 
the most famous writer was actually the most empathetic, but two or three others who were very well known were very distant people who just, just they weren't really interested in teaching. Uh, one of them was my advisor and he told me once, uh, you know, we're not really here to be teachers. This is just a way for the nation to pay good writers to write. And that kind of showed up in the workshops and the classes. And, and so you, you, really, you really want to look at, uh, look at the people and, and maybe look at who's, who's graduated from it because they should be publishing. Uh, we really focused on getting people to send things out and try to get something published. And about 90% of our students did get something uh, accepted at least in a literary magazine before they, they graduated. Uh, they weren't gonna get books out while they were doing an MFA, but, but a lot of them did afterwards and have, have continued to. So that's also one of the things. If the, if the school is not encouraging people to keep writing, do they publish anything after they leave? On the other hand, if everybody publishes a whole lot, Maybe it's, it's like the reputation that Iowa had back in the 70s and 80s, which was uh, the last uh, writer left standing bloody but unbowed was the best, the best critiquer. And that's a terrible workshop to be in. It's, yeah, there, there are a lot of people out there who are, who are um, in all throughout education, higher education, who are just amateur teachers. Um, and that they are good at uh, other aspects of their life doesn't necessarily make them good teachers. So watch out for, for, for that too. Um, yeah, in any university, I think one major problem is that each faculty member has biases and preferences and you're trying to please every one of them rather than writing for yourself. If you write for yourself and find an instructor who loves what you do, you're lucky. That's true. Uh, and I, I, I know I can tell you some, some there are gr great teachers out there who uh, what, a, what a really great teacher is going to do is help you to write like yourself, not teach you to write like them. So I, I think uh, probably one of my favorite out there is Amy Bender, who's an incredibly good teacher. She teaches at USC and UCLA Extension, and she is a magical realist, but she doesn't ask that her, her students are that thing, right? She allows them to be, ah, thank you, uh, allows you to be that, that thing, right? So whatever that is. Um, and uh, I, th I think look at the reputation of, of the, the school, look at the kind of writers they're putting out. Um, also uh, network and ask people who, around you what, what they think. Uh, if you talk to me, I will tell you definitely wh which MFAs I think are, are dangerous. Um, and I think there, there are, are some, um, well, I think there, there, I can name a few that are predatory in the sense of male teachers going after women, right? Things like that, I think you have to be aware of as well. Um, okay. Team Daddy Ham thing. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So, so MFAs. Um, Counselor interruptions. I, I feel like I, I've got I've got this. Uh, I feel like like we've gone through through all of this. Um, does anybody else, uh, Andrew? You have a question or a comment? Yeah. One thing is all the stuff that we've been talking about. I I, I see a lot of people who are familiar. So just going to anything culturama or being anywhere near this like i've, I've known john for 10, 10 years now about 10 years and i don't think i would have ever published without meeting john and that's just for 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 real because he was the first person who said you should submit something and i submitted something and it got accepted i submitted something and it got accepted so just finding anyone who believes in your work is phenomenal and like you'll find that in, in Culturama and in this community is people who will believe in your work and they'll tell you hey this isn't working I know you know maybe you should do this this is how you normally do that and they'll help you find your voice so this is a great community to to be in to overcome the obstacles to find the support that you need to to do to do writing and it's just absolutely fantastic uh, also if, if so let's let's advertise that um we do two submission workshops a week 
on Mondays from two to three, we do poetry and Fridays from two to three, we do fiction. And in that time, we will submit 15 to 15 different magazines, uh, two or three of which will be very big. Uh, so we can all get rejected together. Um, and uh, so bring, bring several, several works all ready to send and we'll, we'll send, the, send those out. And um, it, uh, also I, 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 I spend a good deal of time vetting those magazines, making sure that they're, they're, they're ready for us. Um, okay, so um, what other questions do we have? Uh, do you have any for the narrative essay, uh, places to submit for the narrative essay? Is that what you're saying, Alyssa? Yeah, places to submit or workshops or anything that you guys do with Culturama. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get, my, my friend is about to retire and I'm trying to get her to uh, come work for, for us, but she works at Mount Sac. Her name is Sid Bartman. I, I re referenced her earlier. Um, mm -hmm. She is incredibly good at, at teaching that. Now, are, are you in the area? Are you in the Los Angeles area? No, I'm not, unfortunately. Okay. I was going to say, if you are in the Los Angeles area at RCC, one of the world's best narrative essayists, Joe Scott Coe, teaches. Mm -hmm. um, she is amazing, um, and I, I would go with her. Um, we we sometimes do 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 narrative essays. Um, I I might go with Scott Creeley as well. Um, he teaches out of Whittier College. Um, are you you're in the South, aren't you, Alyssa? I'm in Kentucky, Louisville. Yeah. Okay, so is that the South or is that the Midwest? Uh. About half, you know, half, half each. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm not sure who, oh, I do have a friend. Who, I don't like that guy very much as a teacher. Never mind. Don't, don't go to him. <laughs> uh, so he's, he's a nice enough guy, but, um, but yeah, I mean, we, we, we will do that sometimes. If you, if you submit, I'll, I'll try to try to have a, a week on that. But I, I don't think a week is, is, is really enough. I think if you, you want long-term instruction, you probably want to find something that uh, more fits your, fits your needs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have a list of markets I'll send you that you can share. Okay. And you said that you have a group that meets on Thursdays, like mm -hmm. a writing group that meets online, a, cri a critique group or? Yeah, it's a critique group. We meet from starting at six o'clock on Thursdays, six until question okay. mark. And the question okay. mark gets getting farther and farther. I, I, I'm, at this point, I think I'm gonna have to start breaking it up into breakout rooms because it's starting to get a little bit big. Um, okay. but absolutely, uh, please, okay. please come to that. It's, it's always on the same channel. Okay. Um, what are the questions that we have about uh, writer's block? And if you don't have any questions about writer's block, happy to take a question about anything. We've got about 10 minutes before break. Yeah, Robert. Yeah, I, um, I was at, before we talk about the writer's block question, if you don't mind, uh, I just want to take a moment about Wayne's uh, MFA experience that I had. I was there from the beginning. And the very first thing Wayne said when they started the workshop of the, um, the master's program was uh, if you're here to teach, the door is right behind you. If you, yeah, it was pretty cool. And I go, whoa, this guy's serious. What's next? He says, if you're here to write, welcome. And he was talking about literature, about having some style and some class. So that was really, really cool. Um, which probably leads me to my next issue uh, in terms of uh, writer's block. And that's, um, I have a large body of work and I continue uh, to improve my craft. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> the, the last 10 months have been every night I've been working on, on grammar, for example, and some other things every night, about an hour or so. And I sit outside and do whatever and I work on it. And now I realize just how poor all the stuff that I've written before is, is uh, I just have a huge volume of material. I have a dozen, you know, Norman Rockwell stories. I have a dozen sci-fi stories. Uh, I have two novels, three novels, uh, and tons of poetry and on and on and on. Poetry I can handle and manage. I have no, I can do that in my sleep. But the, but the, the, um, 
the fiction, it just, you know, I, I look at it and go, I know what it's going to take, you know, it, sit down and start editing and rewriting the whole thing. But it just feels, you know, like a mountain that, that's just too far away. Uh, yeah. So it stops um, me from doing that. Yeah, I've, I've got I've got two things to say. And, uh, you know, I obviously can't solve it. And that's not what this is about. Yeah, um, I'm not asking for that. No, I, yeah. Uh, the first thing is about the MFA. Yeah, I, I'm the um, I'm now the adjunct coordinator for the English department in my, my school. And like some MFAs, I really want their 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 people to teach at our school and others I don't. Right. And I think that that's not to, to, to denigrate any MFA It's to say that different MFAs do different things. Right. And well, so it's like focus. Nyla was excellent teaching how to write. Right. But it wasn't wasn't there to teach you how to teach. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, UC Irvine great place to learn how to teach right and they will dedicate you you have to dedicate i don't know a third of what you're doing something like that to teaching theory right it's great it's, it's, it's great. wonderful um and so so the, the, another another side of making sure that you pick the right mfa for you um and uh okay so then the second part is like you've got all this stuff i think it's great that you're looking back at your stuff and saying god that wasn't very good that means you're growing i look at back at my my oh man i i have the like once a month, I want to go back to my, my MFA. They, they have put my thesis in the, in the library. Like they always put theses in the library. I want to take it and like move it someplace. So nobody will ever read it. Right. Okay. Cause it's just, it's so bad. It's just like awful. Um, but I think that's good because that means I've grown. Um, and I think, I think that's a good thing. Now, how do you deal with it? You deal with the one that's most important to you and you go and you start pecking at it. You know, the, the one that really is still meaningful and you, you, you make it, you make it work. Um, yeah. Um, and just work out a little, little bit of time trying to make this one section beautiful and flow, um, like poetry. Um, Tiffany. So I have a couple of questions. Um, one is directly related to what you were just talking about. Um, because I, I have my MFA thesis and I had the option to um, defer the publication for three years um, because you know I'm like I'm trying to get this published and um, I don't want it on record and then if it does get published to defer it basically indefinitely mm. and so <laughs> I've been thinking about that because it's been almost a year now and um, are there any resources that you would recommend in trying to get that compiled into a, a publishable manuscript that could go out. I'll, I'll work on that with you. I'm happy to work on that with you. Um, I, I would work on with, with several people. One of the best uh, poetry editors I know is Scott Greeley. Um, he, you, you know him. Do you know him? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, you, you've played Dungeons and Dragons with him. Um, yeah. You, you, you've, you've seen the silly side of Scott, which yeah. it's a big, that's a big part of him. Um, but he's also a, a tremendously uh, uh, good reader, compassionate reader. Um, mm. And I, I think that's, that's, I think what you need is other people to be working with you at this point. Um, I was just thinking about you earlier today uh, because I, I, you, you've been talking about how you're having a hard time getting back to the The hardest time for me to ever write was right after I finished my MFA. Um, and it's a, it's a lot about the program that I went to. Um, the last advice that I got, uh, my thesis reader said he wasn't going to read my thesis. He said, if you have any bullshit and we both know you have bullshit in there, take it out. <laughs> okay. You know? oh, that, that kind of comment throughout the, those two years was, was, you know, not all that great for me. Yeah, um, but I, 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 I think working with other people is, is, is that's the resource you need right now. Um, make sure you, you come for a, a specific period of time and you just talk about that thing, right? Because it's very easy to run away from the emotional pain of what you're doing because you're writing about emotional things by starting to chat about side issues that have nothing to do with your actual actual text. Right. Um, you, you, you know a lot of really good poets, um, yeah. uh, you know, and, and I think those are the people to talk, to talk with. Um, do, uh, we have a culture on the t-shirt, Chella. Um, we, we pass it out to all the workshop leaders. Um, and now I've got a whole bunch of like extra smalls sitting in the trunk of my car, which I can wear as maybe as a necklace. Um, but that's, I mean, if I, if I, if I get a running start, I might be able to fit, fit into it. Uh, but that, that's, 
I have um I have one other question. It might be pretty quick. Okay, cool. Are there specific um places that you look for good poetry prompts? Good poetry prompts. Um uh working with specific teachers. Uh, that gives me good poetry prompts. Um, Stephanie uh, Barbe Hammy, Hammer uh, always gives mm -hmm. me good prompts. I'm, I'm, I'm working with particular people. I don't know of a good website that gives me, oh, Andrew has one. Yeah, because he's one of our, our leaders. Um, I don't know of a, a particular website. Or, does anybody have a good poetry prompt They're website? They're everywhere. They're everywhere. What am I talking about? I did over a thousand videos of poetry prompts. If you go to my YouTube page, I, I, I've got over a thousand poetry prompts. You have I a YouTube to, page? Yeah, I've got a YouTube page. I, I used to have a website called 30 Days Until Done in which I would give a, a, a unified um, prompt every single day so that in a month you'd have a chat book, right? Um, and I did that for three or four years. And so I now have over a thousand poetry prompts. John, do you have the URL for or your username or whatever uh, it, for youtube I, I just i just called myself john brandingham there i, I don't think there's okay. a okay thank you uh, yeah um oh leanne hunt has a good prompt page i trust leanne she's great tupelo does them for a fee uh, yeah i don't like the fee there are there are books of prompts um absolutely um okay so excellent what other questions do we have we've got about three minutes for questions Poetry Lab has 30 prompts up in Instagram. Okay, thank you, Kelsey. Poetry Lab's really good. If you're in the Long Beach area, I, I really suggest Poetry Lab. Um, oh, is that me? Thank you. Oh, Aruni, did you have a question? Actually, Poetry Lab moved to Pomona. They did? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> uh, that, that means they're close to me again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pomona, if you're in the area, Pomona has become a, the place for poetry, right? Um, or at least did before the pandemic. Um, if you're in this area too, Inlandia has a lot of really great workshops. I, I suggest yeah. Inlandia. <coughs> okay. Enough time for maybe one more question. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do then is we're going to turn off the recording, first of all.